and welcome to the Brookdale Visiting Writer Series show. My name is Suzanne Parker. I'm a professor of English here at Brookdale, where I direct the creative writing program. Today, we have on our show the author Erin Kyle. She is a best-selling novelist and the author of the book The God of Animals, and also an award-winning short story writer. Her new book um, is called Boys and Girls Like You and Me. And so we're very excited to have you on the show, Erin. Welcome. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here. Um, I want to talk about your first book, The God of Animals. It was a, a huge success, a national bestseller, and um, it's a wonderful book. I just reread it, and it was one of those books where I, people tried to talk to me, and I would go, shh, shh, go away, go away. <laughs> Good. Uh, <laughs> um, yes, you made me be rude to my loved ones. So. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> um, I wonder if you could maybe just describe what the book's about for people who may not have read it. Yeah. Um... The book actually was originally a short story that I wrote in graduate school, um, and, and, and several years passed between the time when I expanded the story into a novel. The, the story is about this 11-year-old girl named Alice Winston who's growing up on this sort of dilapidated ranch um, in, in Colorado, a fictional town in Colorado. And at the beginning of the novel, her older sister, who was sort of the star of her family um, has run away. She's eloped with a with a rodeo cowboy, and um, Alice is sort of left with this this hole to fill. Um, and her mother is depressed and sort of bedridden. And and the novel basically spans a year in Alice's life while she sort of tries to fill the empty space that her sister left behind. Um, also, at the beginning of the novel, a girl that Alice went to school with uh, falls into a canal and, and drowns, mm -hmm. and Alice becomes sort of fixated on this girl, even though they didn't really know each other well mm -hmm. um, when the girl was alive. It's, it's you know, it's a coming-of-age story, really, but um, I was really focused when I was working on it on sort of the, the class issues of this mm -hmm. small town. Um, you know, Alice's family has been in this town for generations, and they they run their business, this horse barn. Um, you know, it's very old school. Like, her father hasn't been to college in equestrian sciences or mm -hmm. anything. And, um, you know, in the meantime, like, people are moving into this town. New money is moving in. Um, it's really changing and, you know, becoming sort of I grew up in the West, and I saw that a lot as I was growing growing up, the way that kind of small mom-and-pop places were closing down, mm -hmm. you know, as our third Walmart opened up, or an Olive Garden and a Red Lobster. And uh, I was really interested in exploring the dynamic of a changing yeah. town, but but through a specific family. I had, um, I had read that you actually, when you were growing up, knew a girl who had, um, had died, who had drowned. And she was the inspiration for this character of, of Polly Kane. I'm wondering how that one unique story kind of then evolved into the whole novel. That really is the only part of the book that is is true from my own life. I didn't grow up on a ranch. Um, you know, my father owns an Italian restaurant in Illinois. Um, my mother gets out of bed and goes to work every single day. <laughs> She's very mentally stable. Um, but yeah, when I was in eighth grade, this girl who mm -hmm. I didn't know very well was walking home from school and fell into a canal uh, and drowned. And she was the first person who I knew, I mean, the first person my age, certainly, I, yeah. I knew who had died. Um, you know, I, and I, I don't remember being that sort of preoccupied with it when it, I mean, when it happened, mm -hmm. it was a really big event in my school. This was a small school in a small town. And, um, but as I got older, it just really, it really stayed in, in my head. Um, not just the yeah. death, but the way that people reacted to it. I mean, I remember sort of the drama, all these eighth grade girls, you know, did she fall? Did she jump? Like yeah. it, it took on. She becomes mythic. Yeah, it yeah. became, and, and she was just this quiet girl who mm. no one had paid much attention to when she was alive. And I, I think that my subconscious had been sort of rolling yeah. that around for a long time. Was and there something that triggered it that said, I'm ready, I'm, this is what I'm going to write because it was a short story first, correct? It was. In the Atlantic it was. Yes, the first yeah. chapter was a short story, and and when I went back, I mean, the the first chapter stands. I I never fiddled with it at all. I mean, mm -hmm. the first chapter is, a, and you know, I, I was 23 when I wrote that story, and I so I don't remember a lot about writing it, but I do remember that it came 
like the first line was the very first thing that I had. And, and that drowning is in, you know, the, the first yeah. line. Um, I wonder why, because Alice is, is the central character yeah. of the book. Did you ever tinker with the idea of writing Polly's story? Was it ever going to be hers? Because she's a she's a, a major element of the book in she her absence. She is. Um, she's a and she's a huge part of the yeah. story. Yeah. You know, I never I never really thought about I never really thought about her as anything other than this, you know, the object of Alice's obsession. Hmm. But but when, you know, all these years passed before I came back to the story, and I remember thinking, I have to do something with this character, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. the, of Polly, who's, you know, I mean, dead before the novel even starts. And I, I didn't really want to have Alice sort of mooning over this dead girl for, you know, 250 mm -hmm. pages, the way that she had been in the story. And so I really wanted that obsession that began in the story to lead Alice somewhere new, which, um, you know, she does, she, be, she it forms, you know, she begins to form yeah. relationships with people who had relationships with Polly. And mm -hmm. then that, you know, really affected the plot of, of the novel. Uh, hmm. It's the novel itself is just this incredible, for someone who just rode her first horse this last summer, <laughs> um, <laughs> like this incredible world that I, I learned a lot, just some of it not very nice to know, you know, about how rough and true this world is in a way. Yeah. Um, it surprises me to hear that you don't have kind of a, a horse background, for lack of a better way to say it. I took lessons as a yeah. kid. I mean, and the, the barn of this novel is very much the barn. Uh, I, I should, you know, be careful what I say. I mean, the, the, physically, mm -hmm. the barn looked, in my mind, the way that that barn did, you know, when I was growing up. and. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, Alice's family, you know, if you go to some, you know, some barn today, you're not going to see them doing things the way that, that Alice's family did. There, there are a lot of, you know, really antiquated training methods mm -hmm. and, you know, they do a lot of things wrong. And I, I, I've gotten that from, from readers. I mean, people who didn't really understand necessarily that I, you know, was saying, this isn't the way you should do it. It's just... Yeah. These things, but they do, they yeah. do happen. I mean, the things that I wrote about are, are, for the most part, things that I either saw as a child or heard stories about as a child. Did you research child. for the book at all? I did do some. Yeah. Um, I did do some. I have such a vivid, I only took writing lessons for about four years, but I have really, really vivid memories of that place and that time. Mm -hmm. um, it just became my entire world. Wow for those years, you know, from the ages of, yeah. you know, the, the, the horse years, the 11 to 13. <laughs> um, so I did do, you know, I had like, there were some people online that I would email with and I would say, you know, can this happen? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and they would write back and say, it shouldn't, you know, and I would say, but, but, but well, can it? Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks. <laughs> you know, cause I would need, I'm you not know. looking for best practices here. Right, right. And you know, there were a few things that I tweaked here and there yeah. just for the sake of plot, but yeah. in general. What attracted you to this world then? Was it because you knew it so well in a way, because although you may not have been part of it, it surrounded you? Yeah, I think, you know, I'm, I'm always really in awe of writers who seem to have this incredibly rich imagination when it comes to setting. Mm -hmm. Um, I would, I would love, you know, I would love to be able to, you know, sort of set a story anywhere or at any time. And, and so far anyway, that's just not the kind of writer that I am. Um, and I, I had, I had this idea f and I would say this is true, you know, so far of all of my writing that I, I have this idea of these characters or of this story that I want to tell. And then I find a place that's familiar to me. Hmm. To set it, I mean, I really need to be able to to see the world, to see the landscape. Um, you know, research doesn't quite do it for me. Uh, looking at pictures doesn't. I mean, I need to be able to sort of smell the air. And um, the first novel that I tried to write, which turned out to be a, a failure, was set in um, a Victorian England. I had never been to England at the time. It spanned like a hundred years, and there wow. were carriages, and it was just—it <laughs> just wasn't. It just didn't work. Um, it didn't work on so many levels. Will you go back to it later? I would like to. I yeah. really would. I, it's not dead, but mm -hmm. um, I had moved back to Grand Junction, Colorado, which is where I was raised, and I was, you know, working on this Victorian novel, and I would 
just get so frustrated that in the afternoons I would get in my car, I smoked back then, and I would just like drive around the area where I used to take horseback riding lessons and smoke out the window and think, how am I ever gonna write about these Victorians and their <laughs> carriages? Um, and and at some point I just started thinking about that story again and thinking about oh. those characters and, and I, at one point a scene sort of popped up in my head between you know, one of the very minor characters. Had you already written the story that was in the Atlantic Monthly? Yeah, yeah, years before. So, so it just sort of came back. Once Once yeah. you did start writing it, how long did it take? It, you? like, it roared. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I fought it for a long time. I just thought, this is my subconscious, you know, trying to, you know, trying to woo me away from the Victorians <laughs> because it's hard. And, um, and then one night I thought, you know, I just, I'd had this scene in my head, and I thought, I'm just going to write this scene. Just Which to, scene? Um, it's the scene at the slumber party between Alice and okay. and Sheila's mother, who mm -hmm. is a very minor character in the story, uh, mm -hmm. in the short story. And I had thought, you know, as I'd been driving around, I thought, you know, these people's lives are maybe more complicated than that story had room for. And huh. so one night I just wrote the scene just to get it out of my head. And... And then I just kept going, and and 18 months later, the book was done and sold, and wow. you know, I mean, it was it That's happened great. really quickly. Wow. Well, we have to take a break, but you know, it's it was a, a book that needed to be written, obviously, and it's and it is wonderful. Thank it you. It is wonderful. So please join us after the break. I'm talking with Erin Kyle, and we'll be back soon. I'm Jeff Raspi, the afternoon host of Brookdale Public Radio 90.5 tonight. I'm on every Monday through Friday from 3 to 7 p.m. at 90.5 in central New Jersey and 90.5thenight.org on the web. I get to help hardworking families realize their dream of owning a home. I am part of a team that ensures top quality, luxury, and safety to drivers all over the Tri-State area. I got my start at Brookdale. I got my start at Brookdale. Hi, I'm Rich Robinson, Program Director for Brookdale Public Radio, and you can catch me on the air Monday through Fridays from 10 a.m. till 3 p.m. right here on 90.5 The Night. Welcome back. Um, before the break, Erin, we were talking about the god of animals, and I wanted to, it's got this incredible cast of people in the book, but also this incredible cast of, uh, of, of horses, horses in the book. <laughs> there are a lot of horses. <laughs> but especially Darling, which is this sort of untamable, incredible force of nature in the story. Um, that they've, this horse that they've bought mm -hmm. and that the father is going to tame mm -hmm. um, to make a profit from. Mm -hmm. And as I was reading the book, I was kind of wondering how that horse might connect in with what seemed one of the themes of the book, which is this way of life that's sort of being threatened, that's disappearing a little bit. Um, were you thinking of the two in connection with each other? A bit. Um... You know, the horses, it's, it's funny to, I, I really was, when I was writing, I was trying to hold back on the horses because I, I think I was so nervous. This was my first book and I was so afraid that people were going to be like, oh, you know, oh, she wrote a book about girls and horses. Um, um, were you really afraid I of that? I was so afraid of it. I was so afraid that I was going to be that girl. You that were going to be that like the new book. Black Beauty or something? Yes. <laughs> like, and all those, you know, horse, horse books that people read when they're kids and, um, but one of the things, and I think this is maybe this, like the kernel of the novel that had existed in my brain for years and years. Um, when I would take 
lessons as mm -hmm. a kid. The the trainer who I I just adored my trainer. He had like sort of all of these like philosophies about mares, about female horses. They were much harder to work with than hmm. you know than geldings, which kind of makes sense yeah. actually. Um, but when he had trouble with uh, with a mare, mm -hmm. um, like you know, training her, what he would do is he would put her out in a pasture with all the brood mares and let them just basically beat the hell out of her. And mm. um, and he used to say, you know, horses horses will learn from their elders. And as I, I think that as a thirteen year old girl, like yeah. seeing, you know, a female horse be put out in pasture with a bunch of other female horses, um, you know, to kind of whip her into shape, I. I don't think that the deeper meaning of that was lost on me as, you know, and, and I really, I, I, I wanted, you know, as much as, as much as the novel is about sort of the, the, a changing way of life, there's also a lot of like conflicting, you know, there's the class issue mm -hmm. and there's, you know, sort of the man versus nature. Um, and, and also really there's like a very male and very female energy in the mm -hmm. novel that's that's at odds throughout. Yeah. And um, it, it was really important to me to have this sort of like unbroken energy in the novel. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Alice's mother, you know, who's bedridden throughout was, you know, before Alice has heard all these stories that before she was born, her mother was, you know, this great writer and this mm -hmm. sort of wild, beautiful woman. And, and, and Alice never really knows what happened to sort of take the fight out of her mother. And, mm -hmm. and I wanted, I wanted there to be some, you know, some sort of complementary present thread. And that was oh. what that horse, you know, uh, represents. Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh that's, it's beautifully done. Thank you. I mean, when darling finally is broken, mm -hmm. it's heartbreaking. <laughs> it really is. Um, the circumstances that have surrounded mm -hmm. it, but even just that this horse now finally has been broken in a way. Um, really was a heartbreaking scene. Yeah, I, tr I tried really hard to not humanize the animals mm -hmm. um, as I was writing because I, you know, I think anytime you're writing about animals or children, it's not that hard to become manipulative with your with mm -hmm. your audience. And I really, I really didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to be tugging my audience, my readers around. Um, I really, you know, I wanted the horses to be horses. I didn't want to give them human qualities mm -hmm. and I didn't, um, but I still, you know, I mean, I still wanted people to be emotionally invested in them. I mean, I was yeah. emotionally well, I, invested I certainly in was. them, so <laughs> thank you. Um, it's interesting what you say about not wanting to manip manipulate, in a way, or it's easy to manipulate with, with the animals or the children because your, your protagonist in this is 11, 12 mm -hmm. years old. And I wonder what it was like to write from such a young point of view. Was this something that you sort of struggled with? Because there's such adult themes in the book. Um, you know, what made you arrive at that decision? The voice just came very naturally yeah. to me. And everything that I, I write, I think, starts more than anything with voice. Like, if the voice doesn't feel authentic to me, I, I, I put it aside until it's ready because... Yeah. I mean, I think everything else comes from, you know, comes from character, plot comes from character. And um, y yeah, the, the character of Alice just was incredibly easy for me to access. Yeah. I mean, again, she's not, she's, she's not me. Um, I mean, I, I, I certainly was nothing like that as a 12 year old. That said, I, I think that a lot of the things that I was learning in my early 20s when I was you know, when I, I think in many ways I came of age in my early twenties. Uh -huh. That was how old I was when I realized that the world was more complicated than I thought it was that, mm -hmm. you know, that, that people could be good and, and do bad things, you know, could do mm -hmm. bad things for the right reasons, if that makes sense. Um, and, and I, I kind of put that on this child, you know, I, I let her sort of work out the questions that I was having mm -hmm. and, um, you know, kind of gave her the freedom, you know, to ask the questions maybe that I was afraid to ask or to make the mistakes that I was afraid yeah. of making. Um, well, it's interesting that you say that because boys and girls like you and me, the which is a collection of short mm -hmm. stories, has, again, a number of stories which focus on adolescents mm -hmm. or people in their early 20s. And I would say probably all but one 
center on female characters as well too. Um, so it's boys and girls like you and me, and then there's Captain. Is it Captain Captain's, Club? Captain's Club, yeah. Ca yeah, which has a, a, a central character <laughs> yeah. that that's uh, we got a boy. <laughs> right. Yeah, he's a token boy. So when I, the book came out, I was like, if you like girls and one token boy, <laughs> right. boy and girls like you and me. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it seems like I mean this this is a a passage, a period in yes. time, maybe that's attracting you. It certainly was then. I mean, you know, more than half of the stories mm -hmm. in this collection were actually written before I wrote the novel. Um, really? So even ah. though it was the second book... Um, in, so in, these weren't written with a project in mind? No, they weren't. Um, the last... F the, the, the final four stories, which are not like the last four in the book, they're um, interspersed, were written after. And one of them is, is Captain's Club, mm -hmm. um, which... You know, it, when I wrote that, it was because I had sold the collection, and when I sort of put all the stories side by side, you know, and they, they'd all been published in places, and I put them side by side, and I was like, <laughs> oh my, like, like two of them actually started with the same first line, and I, you know, I mean, really? wow. it, it, there, there are problems <laughs> with having things that you never originally envisioned being, mm -hmm. having to live together inside a book, and, um, you know, so at that time, I, I wanted to sort of figure out, you know, you still wanted to have some sort of feeling that they all belong together, mm -hmm. or there, there's an arc, or that there's a journey at least that a reader will take. And it was so important to me to get a male, a male character in yeah. there. And so that story was written on purpose to a certain extent. Like I have a, purpose, a void I need to fill here. But I had to, yeah. I had to wait a while until it came to me. Uh -huh. And then when it did, I mean, it's my, it's probably what I'm going to read tonight, and it's. Um, it's my favorite story in the collection. Um, it is? It is. Um, Why? I, that character, just when he came, you know, with the, with the girls, I'm, I think I'm harder on them, you know? And, and this character was just so... I just loved him so much. He's a mm. really gentle spirit. Yes. And, um, and he's so unguarded. Yeah, and really yeah. just pure and... Um, and actually, the character in that story uh, very much influenced the novel that I'm writing now, which is a, oh. which is about a, a a man in his you know in his late thirties. I mean, I've really kind of moved on now. I think I've, you know, gotten through my my adolescence um, <laughs> on the page, and and I'm ready to deal. Yeah, at one point, I remember just thinking, you know, like grown ups are just kids with money. <laughs> and after I realized that, I could write about adults. But up until that point, it was it was always really kids. that you all yeah, of a sudden it, it gave like, you it permission. And I was like, oh, you know, yeah, we're, we're really not. We haven't evolved really, all that much. We're really not that more, and we're not any more complicated. <laughs> we can yeah. just buy our own we clothes just, now. <laughs> we can just buy what we want. Um, and kids can't. Kids have to get someone else to buy it for them. <laughs> Which is why some of them look funny. Right. Or I did. Yes. <laughs> I definitely did. And I really can't blame that on anyone but myself. Well, what's the difference? So, well, actually, how, what's the spread of time, then, that the stories came from? Ten years. Wow. Um, did you, did you, that's exciting, though. Did you notice when you spread yes. them out how you'd evolved as a writer at yes. all? Yes. What did you discover? It was really interesting. And the oldest story in the collection I wrote when I was 22 and the most recent yeah. one when I was 31. So, really, almost a decade. And Which ones are they? Um, uh, this is embarrassing to say. Okay, so the oldest one is Sex Scenes from a Chain Bookstore. Oh, that's a great story. Okay, thank you. I refuse <laughs> to read it aloud. I, like, even when I was, like, copy editing it, I was kind of doing it with one eye. And it's not, you know, I'm not, I mean, I'm not ashamed of it or anything. It's just, I mean, it's a little bit like, you know, having to stand next to a picture of yourself taken when you're 22, mm -hmm. you know, and, like, you thought the outfit was great at the time, but, but <laughs> trends have changed. Um, but I love how that story, though, captures that subculture. It seems like actually you're attracted a little bit to sort of these sort of small cultures that we have, like of the horse world. Or, I mean, yeah. anyone who's ever worked in retail. I worked in a bookstore yeah. in college, so. How, there's a little culture that goes with that. Or, you know, if you've waitressed, yeah. there's that subculture that goes with that. Yeah. And that story gets that. It really does. Um, but. And then, strangely, you know, the, the newest story in the collection is the title story, Boys and Girls Like You and Me, which... Oh. I don't know that anyone else would see this, but when I look at those two stories, I can see so clearly how they evolved from each other. I mean, really, in particular, those two stories, oh. that that character, you know, evolved from the character in sex scenes. And So what you see is how, not necessarily your writing style, but literally how your, your people, your yes. characters have changed. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I do keep, I, I do think I keep kind of working with the same people, but they get 
more complicated as I get more complicated and, hmm. you know, their worlds change as my world changes. I mean, new people come in as well. I mean, new characters. This sounds really new agey, what I'm saying. But, um, but I, yeah, I mean, I definitely can see, and, and there are others in, in the collection, you know, I can see like, oh, I, I think that, you know, I mean, writers, we're drafting, we're drafting all the time. Mm -hmm. and, and if we're lucky, some of those drafts get published, you know, and, and yeah. we get to keep going, but that doesn't mean we're finished. And, you know, so I think that like sex scenes was a really early draft <laughs> of boys and girls like you and me. And I, I had to write it to get to where you are now. Yeah. Well, I wish we could keep talking. And I know that you're working on a new book, so I look forward very much to Thank seeing that you. on the shelves soon. Um, I have been talking with Erin Kyle, novelist and short story writer. Last book out was Boys and Girls Like You and Me, and it has been a pleasure having you on the show. Thank you. It's been great. Thanks for talking with us.